Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the 269th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where three days a week we work together educating and inspiring you to become part of your food revolution. Nature doesn't waste energy, and by using these natural cycles to work in our favor, we can harvest both plants and fish. Let us teach you how. Just text GROWFISH to 33444 or visit IWANTTOGROWFISH.COM and you will receive our free webinar on how to grow your own fish-powered garden. Today on our podcast, we have someone who is an activist and educator about a side topic to growing food, but important to anyone who likes the outdoors. We're talking to Sarah Schlichty Sanchez about Lyme disease. Sarah contracted Lyme disease as a teenager. However, it took 17 years of pain and suffering before she received an accurate diagnosis. Since starting the treatment at the age of 37, she has devoted her time to help others cope with the daily struggles of living with a chronic illness. She is an author, speaker, and entrepreneur, and together with her husband, Aaron, produce a regular podcast called Lyme Voice. Welcome to the show today, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me, Greg. Absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Yeah. So I am located in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And in New Mexico, we have very few ticks, but technically Lyme does not exist here. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, right. Nor does it, nor does it exist in Phoenix, Arizona. Right. Right. Yeah. And honestly, like we don't see a lot of ticks at all, but they're around and much like everyone else in every other state across the United States, we're dealing with the ramifications of Lyme. So I'll just tell you a little bit about my story. 39 now, but I actually got bit and had a bullseye rash when I was 18. It was my senior year and we went camping for spring break. In New Mexico? In New Mexico. Yep. Just a couple hours from our house. I know exactly where I was, like GPS coordinates, everything. And I had a huge bullseye rash that looked, it was about the size of a fist. And I, what was so weird is I went to the doctor specifically because it was this huge oozing mess. I had it probably for about two and a half months. Whoa. And yeah, it was crazy. But that was back in 1996 when there was no such thing as Google images. Right. (laughs) And so I was told it was an infected spider bite. As far as I know, I never got antibiotics. I have not been able to find any of those records. But Mm -hmm. from that point forward, and I did do a very classic, you know, didn't feel good for a week, ran a fever, some of those classic symptoms, but really it just disappeared and never thought much of it. I had no idea really that summer is when I began to live with just chronic migraines. Mm. And I would go to the doctor because they would put me in bed for anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. And I'm pretty high functioning. So this was a weird thing for me to just be laid out on on my bed for a day or two. Mm -hmm. But really, life just went on and never knew anything different. But what ended up starting to unfold that summer for me was just dealing with chronic fatigue. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like this big obtrusive force in my life. It was just always there. So if I got a cold, it took me a long time to recover from it. If someone else got tired, it took me twice as long to recover. Mm -hmm. So it was really just a lot of that stuff. So as I'm going through my 20s, my husband and I, we have three kids. And during each of my pregnancies, I was very, very sick and had a ton of complications, things that nobody could ever figure out. But I just couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't function. And because I was in my early 20s, again, I was just told like, oh, you know, people have a hard time with pregnancy. And I'm like, really? (laughs) You know, by the third. By the third pregnancy, I'm like, this is not right. Like something is so wrong here because I, again, could barely function when I was pregnant. So, you know, but you just keep, right? You just keep going. 
Yeah. One of the things I learned way, it took me way too long to learn is like for so many years, the bulk of the physicians that I was seeing, they were not going to help me restore my health. If anything, they were going to help me get a diagnosis. But in a sense, I felt like I was doing everything I knew to do because I was going to these physicians time and time again. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand the difference between a physician who can prescribe you a medication to bandage the symptoms versus a physician who can help you actually restore your health, whether that's through antibiotics or whether that's through homeopathy or mm -hmm. organic eating. So I feel like I just wasted a lot of years yeah. because I didn't know what I was up against. Well, and that seems to be one of the big challenges with Lyme disease is it's not a widely understood disease, but it seems to be a widely spread disease. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely is. And even for us, I have two kids for sure of my three pregnancies, two of my kids have Lyme disease and wow. our, our youngest son ended up having issues right when he was born. But our daughter, as she hit puberty is when her, her symptoms really flared up. And so, you know, we're just kind of on this long journey and we're not exactly sure when it's going right. to end and what it's going to take. But again, on our podcast, Lime Voice, we talk about this extensively because it is so confusing. And for each person, depending on the state they're located in, the resources they have, mm -hmm. everybody's treatment options are so varied as well. Yeah. So there's really no clear cut, simple answers for people with Lyme. And so that's why even shows like yours where you're getting out and talking about it and exposing people to it are so important because, I mean, you guys are part of the grow your own food movement. Yep. And for I didn't understand any of that in the mm, first right. 10 years of chronic fatigue. And I remember asking many times, don't you think I should see a nutritionist? Like I'm reading all this, <laughs> right. you know, I'd read about Gerson protocol and I'm like, I'm reading all this stuff about, you know, health being restored through organic foods. And shouldn't I go talk with a nutritionist? And they'd look at my page and they're like, nope, you're fine. You eat a decent diet, you yep. know, but it was so hard to come to that place where I had to set aside all the years of physicians' opinions and say, you know what, I don't know if this is going to work to restore my health, but what you've offered me so far has failed miserably. Yeah. So honestly, I have nothing to lose. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So for me, for me, it just was a really long journey. It took 17 years and mine, even though I struggled during my three pregnancies in my mm -hmm. 20s, mm -hmm. in my early 30s, I was involved in a very simple hit and run accident. It should not have been a big deal. And I was completely debilitated by pain. And wow. yeah, it was weird. Except here's the thing is there's almost always a traumatic event for someone, whether it's the traumatic event getting bit mm -hmm. or a pregnancy or a divorce or car accident. Like as I looked back, it was very easy to see that this car accident for me triggered my downward spiral. Right. And so I just spent about two years going to the chiropractor several, several times a week, doing acupuncture and massage and doing everything I could do to mitigate the migraines and the extreme pain and fatigue mm -hmm. and just never got anywhere. And about two years after that first accident, my chiropractor said, you know, you just might be one of those people who can't recover. Wow. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, sorry, <sighs> you're one of the unlucky, like 3% who can't recover, you know, kind of have a nice life. Right. And, and so at that point, I had kind of accepted the fact that I would live with chronic pain and fatigue for the rest of my life. Had you been diagnosed at that point? No, at that point, I had a diagnosis of fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. And I got diagnosed with fibromyalgia back in the day when most physicians said fibromyalgia doesn't exist. Right. So, you know, 
we went to out in New York a couple of years ago to the Living Well with Lyme Disease Conference, and it's run by Dr. Richard Horowitz, and it's a spectacular conference. He said in that conference that like 70 to 80 percent of people with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia have Lyme. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Which is a huge number. Yeah. They, they call Lyme the, what, the great impersonator for disease? Yeah. Yeah. There's about 150 different symptoms that people end up with. And yeah, they call it the great imitator. Yeah. And it is. Yeah. It just leaves you grasping for straws mm-hmm. and trying to hold your life together. When I, I, and you've already kind of touched on this a little bit, but the biggest challenge is actually finding someone a practitioner that will work with you. Cause I know when Heidi, both Heidi and I have Lyme. I, I think most of my listeners know that both Heidi and I have Lyme. And when Heidi was diagnosed, uh, she self diagnosed here. In, actually, let me step back. She actually got a bullseye bite here in Phoenix, Arizona. Cause we weren't during the six month period that she got uh, contracted Lyme. We weren't outside of Phoenix, Arizona. So she got this bullseye bite. We didn't know what it was. Four months later, she self-diagnosed, went to the doctor. The doctor laughed at her, told her, told her she was crazy. She insisted that the doctor, you know, run a Lyme test. And, you know, the do- doctor kind of pushed back a little bit. And if you know Heidi, you don't mess with Heidi. She's you, <laughs> if, Once she puts her foot down, she's going to get what she wants, which is really cool. Yeah. You know, I love that about her. Turns out the Lyme test came back positive. So this doctor put her on 10 days worth of antibiotics on, on day 11. She was in the hospital for two weeks. Oh gosh. And of the 10 or so doctors that saw her in the hospital with a positive Lyme test in my hand, cause I was her caregiver at that point. Yeah. Every single one of them denied that she could have Lyme. Yeah. So this is the kinds of things, and I, I hear this from people all the time. These are the kinds of things that we bump up against. I'm sure you've seen that, yes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's what's so heartbreaking about mm-hmm. it is that people, you know, we're trained within the American medical system to believe what's what's being told to us. and And they practice medicine based on tests. And so if you have a test that isn't coming up the way they think it will be, and I get that. I mean, they're in a hard position too, but it's just so tragic because we hear that story over and over and over. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even for me, um, before I actually did get a Lyme diagnosis, I had neurological Lyme. Mm -hmm. So one of the things about Lyme disease is it can change shapes. And so it can go from a spirochete and it can burrow its way into your cells. So one of the things that happens is people's immune system does not fight it off because the Lyme is hidden within the cells. Yeah. And so for me, I was, because Lyme can cross the blood brain barrier, you know, there's neurological Lyme, which is what I was dealing with. And so I was having seizures and um, at that point was no longer driving because I felt like I was dr- driving drunk and mm-hmm. actually got lost one time on my way home from my kid's school, which was uh, like one and a half miles away from my house and yeah. could not find my way home. So all this stuff is going on and they're saying, oh, maybe it's MS, maybe it's this. I think at the time I was on like 11 medications. Wow. So like four of them were pain meds. Mm -hmm. Two of them were to control the seizures. And so we're, you know, seeing all these specialists. And again, at this point, I'm telling them, I'm pretty sure I have Lyme. I had a bullseye rash when I was 18, but I didn't know what it was. I have a video of the seizure on my phone and I had gotten this appointment with a neurologist and he had bumped me to the front of the line because I was in crisis and I'm sitting in the wheelchair, cannot drive and my husband is there with me Mm. and has the video on our phone and he refused to look at the video and then he said, you are causing this by anxiety attacks. Wow. (laughs) Which I was just like, this is, I don't even know where to begin right. with that. Yeah. Yeah. And for, yeah. for our listeners out there, 
that this is a lot of what I've heard from people is that there's a lot of pushback. Doctors telling us that we're making it up, that it can't be happening, that, you know, it's something else that, you know, so on and so on. And this is where we have to stand up and say, you know what, this is really happening to me. We've got to do something about it. And we have to be responsible for our own health. Yes. And you know what? You bring up a really good point because for so many years, I wasn't being responsible for my health. Mm -hmm. I was from, for what I had been trained in, you know, I kept calling, kept going in for appointments, kept saying, no, there's something wrong, draw blood work again, you know, knowing that at some point something would turn up. But it is, it's just this, I remember as soon as I did actually get a positive Lyme test and I'm thinking, oh, thank God, like I finally know what's been going on. Mm -hmm. And well, and then I realized this disease that I have is wrapped in this huge conspiracy of whether or not it exists. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I just want to get better. But you know, it's interesting. There is a documentary called how to survive a plague. And it is about the AIDS epidemic in the eighties. It is fascinating for any of you guys thinking that you're dealing with Lyme out there. Please watch that. You can find it on Amazon, How to Survive a Plague. Mm -hmm. And they show the story of what people went through to get treatment and had to fight for it. But here's the thing that is different is they did not have the internet. Right. Right? Yes. So they would sit in big group meetings and read through medical papers and stuff as they were getting released. And the thing I love about that documentary is for so long, I kept thinking like, okay, I was told repeatedly to just adjust to my new normal. And I understand what the physicians were saying, like, Mm -hmm. oh, okay, the life you had is no longer available to you. So you need to learn to live within this, within these restrictions. But Lyme is so restrictive. Like, even if you push away the pain, you can't push away the fatigue. Even if you push away the fatigue, you can't push away the seizures. And so I think that really we're doing a great disservice to ourselves by not trusting ourselves. And, you know, like you said, Heidi did, like, no, there's something wrong here. And I got to the point when I left that neurologist's office, I called my mom and I said, I had been reading for a couple of years on the Gerson protocol Mm -hmm. and Gerson, if you're not familiar with Gerson protocol, it's in line with everything you guys stand for (laughs) on urban farming. It's about taking vegetables, juicing them down so your body can absorb it in the easiest way possible. And then they pair that with coffee enemas to detox Mm -hmm. and I called my mom and I said, I don't know if this is going to work implementing the Gerson, but no one is staying up at night trying to figure out what's wrong with me. And I feel like I'm on my own. Right. And she said, okay, let's figure it out. Let's just do it. And so we sat and ordered the videos, watched them. And Mm -hmm. at that point I could only stand for a couple minutes throughout the day and I'd have to sit down. So she basically moved in with us and started implementing it for me. And what was so fascinating about this after, you know, at this point, I'm 17 years into dealing with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, all these issues, taking a ton of medications that Mm -hmm. barely ease the pain. After just a couple of days of doing the Gerson therapy, the original bullseye rash that I had on my left hip. Hold on. Popped it came back. It popped back up. Wow. It blew my mind and it hurt. Like it was excruciating for several days. I was like, what wow. is going on here? So not the original like wound, but like the trace of the original size of that mm-hmm. bullseye rash popped yeah. back up, like looking like a Interesting. scar. Interesting. Yeah. I want to, I just want to stop you here just for a moment. It's Gerson, G E R S O N. Yes. Dot org. G E R S O N dot org. They've got a couple of clinics around the planet. And yeah, go check out their website if you're experiencing anything around this. Yeah. And it's a ton of work to juice every day. And especially when you are dealing with chronic fatigue. But 
it's just so powerful. And in a sense, I felt like, you know, I actually did the Gerson, the full protocol six days a week for the first two years mm -hmm. of my recovery. And about 18 months into doing it, I just came to appreciate the daily discipline, but like what your food can really do for you. Yeah. It's so powerful. And I just wish that like my only regret is that I waited, you know, a couple of years thinking if this is really something that can work to cure these illnesses, why am I not hearing about it from my physicians? Right. And I went in multiple times saying, hey, I'm reading about this. And what do you think? And I was told repeatedly, you can drink all the juice you want. It's never going to make your chronic fatigue go away. Mm -hmm. And yet days into it, it was attacking that original bite in a way that none of the medications had ever even touched. Wow. So I want to dig a little deeper here into a couple of things. First of all, let's talk about the symptoms. And I don't want to talk about specific symptoms. I want to put these symptoms in buckets. So you've already said neurological symptoms. What do neurological symptoms look like for you? So what it looked like for me initially was a lot of twitching, mm -hmm. a lot of like restless leg. Eventually my fists, my hands started to curl together, almost like mm. someone with MS. Mm -hmm. I also dealt with, it just felt like bolts of lightning were running down mm. my body mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Yeah. And it would jolt your whole system in this sense of panic, like, at, like just getting stuck with a needle in your nervous system. Right. I actually have that happen fairly have often. I'll, I'll jump. It's like something moves and I'll jump. Yeah. Um, you know, and the, the, and so another neurological piece for me is I have a shake on the right, a nerve, a tremor on my right. And you know, that's, that's another tremors are another thing. Right. And then, so it, you, you mentioned MS there's other things that it mimics, is there not? Yeah, MS, Parkinson's, mm. dementia. Mm. And I mean, if you are curious, there is a phenomenal documentary called Under Our Skin. And I think that it has probably saved so many people's lives. Mm -hmm. It was huge for me when, my, when I finally saw a physician back in 2013 who finally said, you know, this looks like a little bit like Lyme disease. And she knew because she had a daughter who had dealt with Lyme disease. And, you know, from that point when she said, hey, have you ever heard of Lyme disease? And then we Googled a bullseye rash. And for me, that was this huge aha wow. moment where yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, that's what my bite looked like. I didn't even know they were connected. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the in the different buckets of things, that's what's so confusing about Lyme is... When you have sleep issues and you have issues with your nervous system and you have issues with your immune system and <laughs> all these aspects, yeah. you really do start to think, I must be losing my mind yes. because nobody has all of this stuff at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Unless you have Lyme disease. Unless you have Lyme. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unless you have Lyme. <laughs> so the, neurological, you mentioned headaches. Uh, one of the things that Heidi experienced was it's like bugs crawling on her. Yes. You know, there's, yeah, it affects every single part of your body and it can do that because it can change shape and it can go into cells and it can go into, you know, tendons and different parts, soft tissue that's in your body, which mm -hmm. is, you know, a lot of people with arthritis are finding out that they have Lyme. And so, right. you know, when you're talking about this bacteria that wreaks all this havoc, the problem is also that most of the Lyme bacteria comes with a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I had, I think, four other major infections going on right. that had to be treated. So you mentioned spirochete. What we didn't call it is a bacteria. And as opposed to a virus. So Lyme is a bacteria and a spirochete bacteria is, it's like a corkscrew because you, you said it can actually corkscrew down into your muscle and tissue and then it's yeah. harder to get rid of. And this bacteria lives in your muscles. It also lives in your blood, hence your children have it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So much like AIDS, it, yes, it is in your blood. And at this point, we had my husband tested four years ago when I found out what I had. 
And he was experiencing a lot of symptoms, but didn't come back positive. But two of our kids did. Mm. And so, yes. Yeah, me too. I know. That was so heartbreaking. It was one of the most atrocious days, you know, as I'm realizing, you know, really the fight that I've endured for so long and this horrendous thing that is stolen from us. And then to realize I passed it on to my kids was just heartbreaking. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, it passes to your kids. So my kids both have congenital Lyme. And again, when I went to their pediatrician and said, hey, these are the test results. And I actually went in 2013, I went to Invita Medical out in Scottsdale, Scottsdale. Arizona. Uh-huh. Yeah, I went to their clinic for two months and then came home and finished a two year program at home. Mm-hmm. But both of my kids are on abbreviated versions of that. They're not at a place where they need to go to a clinic, but it just it affects even our kids differently. And they say that Lyme has about 150 different symptoms and, wow. you know, pain dull long-term pain, neurological issues, Mm -hmm. frequent headaches. Those are pretty common with kids specifically. But it is so common, Greg. Dr. Jay Davidson just did an online chronic Lyme disease summit. Yeah. And it was in June. It's available online if you're interested. It's got, I think, about 40 hours of content. And he said in that interview that Lyme is now twice as common as breast cancer. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And he also said, like, we knew Lyme could be transmitted through fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. But he said now they're tracking it in spiders. Really? Yeah. Wow. I know. So as you and Heidi have experienced it doesn't go away very quickly. And so one of the things we talk about on our podcast is that Lyme becomes a marathon and not a sprint. Yeah. And that's where what you guys are talking about, the whole grow your own food movement is so so huge. Yeah. 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 And when I went out to Invita, I was really amazed at all the physicians were very supportive of Gerson which I had already been on for a couple of months at that point, Mm -hmm. but they themselves modeled some of those things. So they ate a ton of like, I didn't realize the value of organic food. Oh my gosh. Huge. Huge. And now that I understand that on a deeper level, I'm, you know, I just didn't give my body anything to fight with. Right. Right. It wasn't fighting off the infection because I didn't understand that organic lettuce was different than regular lettuce. Right. Right. (laughs) So important. So important. Yeah. And so it becomes this when you're when you're facing something that is not going to go away and that has long term generational implications to your family. It really does force you to look at every everything you used to think and believe and Mm -hmm. come to this place where you're like, okay, does this thought process help move me forward? And for me, that was like, okay, the physicians I'm seeing are not actually helping me. Right. So I just had to learn like, okay, these, even if I get a diagnosis and once I did, it wasn't even accepted. Mm -hmm. I just thought, okay, I have to go to the physicians where people are actually getting better. Yeah. And when you start on that journey, then you're talking about high doses of supplements or orthomolecular mm-hmm. medicine, which I love. I took about 65 supplements a day for... Oh, wow. I know. And I thought I was taking a lot at about 30. <laughs> you know, yeah. It, but even that one simple fact, as I have talked, I probably talked to several hundred people over the last four years who have either been recently diagnosed or heard us talk on a on one of the podcasts or just heard our podcast. Mm-hmm. And so many of them are on that journey too of yeah. realizing really our medical system is not meant to give us health. I call it our death care system. And I can't believe oh. I just said that publicly, but when <laughs> you really look one. when you really look at it, that's what it does. It's not here to help us. And I'm sorry for any doctors that are listening out there. I'm sure if you're listening to this podcast, this is not the case for you. 
And so this is not against you. It's just I've had so many negative experiences with our our medical system. Yeah. You know. It was interesting. We have a friend and cousin who is a physician and you know, and he for years worried about me, looked over my blood work. Mm-hmm. He was he was one of the first people when I was at the point of being a hundred percent disabled. He said, Sarah, you need to get out of this state. He said, you've been seeing physicians in New Mexico. You need to go look outside the state. Mm. But what was so fascinating is when I actually had a Lyme diagnosis, he said the exact same thing. Lyme doesn't exist in New Mexico. Mm. (laughs) So it can't be Lyme. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, okay, but what do I do? Okay, maybe it's not Lyme but what do I do in the meantime? Right. And, but this is what was so fascinating. So at Invita, they do, I did two months of antibiotics, pulsated antibiotics, mm-hmm. but with a huge emphasis on boosting your immune system. Oh, so huge, yes. I, yeah, I took a ton of standard process supplements. We did blood ozone, infrared sauna, coffee enemas, colonics, all these things to boost your immune system and flush out all the die off, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, and they did high, high doses of vitamin C every other day and oh, right. really, high, really high doses of hydrogen peroxide. Oh. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I wasn't. Mm-mm. But what was so amazing is I, like, the pain that I had had for years and years, I thought I would always live with, started to dissipate within days of oh, starting. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was crazy. And I was not familiar with colonics. I had been doing coffee enemas because of the Gerson protocol. Mm -hmm. But when I got to treatment, they wanted us to go in and do a a colonics appointment like three to four times a week. Wow. And I Uh. was like, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I know. (laughs) We say we live in this crazy world where we talk about bowel movements and, you know, (laughs) colonics visits. I'm like, it's just part of it. It is. It's just part of it. So when I was at treatment, I I think it was like the first week, the first eight to 10 days where I went in for my first colonics appointment and I was in a wheelchair. I had been in a wheelchair for at least several months on and off. I would have, because neurological stuff ebbs and flows, there were days that I could walk and stand, Uh but predominantly I was in a wheelchair. When I got out of that first colonics appointment, I walked out to my car. Whoa. Yeah, my dad was pushing the wheelchair in case I like started to stumble, but I walked out and I told him, I said, oh, it's probably just like a fluke. Like I'll be back in my wheelchair tomorrow morning. And I never went back in. Nice. And what was so amazing is like even that one little thing, understanding the power of colonics. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. You know, they used to do colonics and enemas in hospitals. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They don't do that anymore. So I want to shift just a little bit here. And if somebody thinks, so we need, what I want to do is I want to give somebody a pathway yeah. to start looking. First of all, you definitely want to tune in and listen to Lime Voice. I've listened to multiple episodes of yours and you, know, you guys deliver some amazing information. So thank you very much for doing that. Number, awesome. Number one, if you think you have Lyme, what, yes. What What do we do for testing? So that is different depending on the state you're in because different different tests are available. There's a standard Western blot that you can get. But let me first just say that Lyme is a clinical diagnosis. And so mm. it's not going to be one test. There's not one magical test that will tell you yes or no. Got it. There's an Igenix test. And within the natural holistic realm, and even at Invita, they put a lot of stock into that test. Mm -hmm. Traditional doctors do not. And so what I have found is that for the most part, you usually have to do different types of testing. And then a physician will look at those different tests and give you a clinical diagnosis. Got it. So there are tests coming that there's even like a urine test that should be available pretty soon that's supposed to be pretty clear. But this is what's so weird and why Lyme is hard to, it's hard to get a diagnosis and then find treatment is like vets test for Lyme disease in animals all the time. Mm -hmm. 
it's no big deal. You can go in, you get really? them on antibiotics. Yes, but we we don't have we don't have one test that people can go to. So you've got to find a physician who, you know, they say Lyme literate, find a Lyme literate physician. But my advice would be that wherever you are at on this journey, you've got to educate yourself. Yeah. You have to stick with your gut. If there's if you know there's something wrong, stick to that and find a physician who will not only give you a diagnosis, but find out if that physician, if you get a diagnosis, can help you heal. Because if they can only give you a diagnosis mm -hmm. but can't help you heal, then you're just going to have to go to another physician and start all over again. Right. So, yeah, get a physician who can help you not only understand the testing, but then actually help you treat it. Yeah. And then watch the documentary Under Our Skin. There's Under Our Skin 1 and 2. And those are just really profound because for me, I had had a lot of fatigue and neurological issues but when I, there's one scene in that movie where the girl is, the blonde girl, I forget her name, is walking across the grass and she can barely walk. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, she looks like I, like I do. Yeah. And so it is, and it's so funny. We actually published a children's book a couple months ago about Lyme, a little mama bird and her family. And it's called Little Bite, Big Trouble. Mm -hmm. And the mama bird gets a bullseye rash. So the local reporter came out and was interviewing us. And we're sitting there talking to him for like an hour and a half trying to explain Lyme. And because he's like, well, what about, <sighs> isn't there a test? No, there's not a test, you know, right. going through this. And I said, I'm sorry, I feel like we're not doing a very good job of articulating what the complexities of this. And Aaron goes, no. We are. That's why we have 40 hours on Lyme Voice of trying to figure out how to cope with this illness because yeah. there aren't these clearer pathways. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned this whole being able to test for pets. What's yeah. different about testing pets than testing ourselves? You know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what it is that's different. It shouldn't be that hard. And here's the other thing. One of the things that people run into. So again, I have a physician in, in my family who's a cousin. And he was the one saying there's no such thing as Lyme in New Mexico. After I went out to treatment and came back and he was looking at all the different protocols they put into place. He said, Sarah, he said, I don't agree with like, I don't agree with the level of like, high doses of vitamin C IVs. I don't agree with the high doses mm -hmm. of hydrogen peroxide and all these other things. He said, but I haven't seen you be able to walk that normal in years. Yeah. So whatever they're doing is working. Yeah. And so, yeah, when you do have a physician who's saying there's no such thing as Lyme or it can't be Lyme, gosh, it's so hard, but you've got Fine. to just stick with your gut and say, no, there's something wrong. Yeah. Find somebody new. The good, I think the good news is, is that today in 2017, there's a lot more Lyme literate physicians out there, Lyme literate practitioners out there that can help Yeah. than there was say 10 years ago. Yeah. And you know, we interviewed Dr. Naylor who practices in Colorado. And I said, at what point are we going to be at a place where there's affordable care for everyone? Right. Uh -huh. And he said, you're assuming we're moving in that direction. And he said, since Obamacare went into effect, he said, I can't even get an insurance company to cover the standard antibiotics that I need to prescribe. Wow. He said, we're absolutely moving in the wrong direction and it's not going to be affordable. Yeah. And that just blew my mind because mm -hmm. I'm thinking, man, with, with AIDS, when there was a pill, you know, even though it was very expensive initially, People's, people who have AIDS have a very good quality of life. Right. And I was assuming we're headed in that direction, and I don't, I don't know that we are. I don't, I don't see it. Yeah. I don't see it. With what we've been through in the past three years, I don't see it. Yeah. This is where we have to be really diligent about our own health. And unfortunately, it's not inexpensive. It's not. It, it really isn't. But I think it... 
you know, it requires just this level of transformation. Like we talked about, like figuring out your beliefs and what you value. And one of the examples that is just so crystal clear in my mind, as I was going to different physicians and trying different supplements and, you know, just trying hit or miss all these things, my husband, you know, I'd be like, oh, okay, I had to buy $150 worth of supplements or I bought $300 worth of supplements. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting is understanding that when we're facing an illness, we all come with programming in advance, Mm -hmm. right? Either beliefs or programming. And I grew up in a chiropractic family that was very much into supplements and good eating. His family, he said, the only thing I ever remember hearing about vitamins is that they were expensive pee, oh, wow. which in his family, what was being said is that vitamins are worthless. You're just going right. to pee them out. Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. So in approaching this long term illness, though, that three of us have, we had to even come to a place of understanding that the way we view vitamins is different the way the value we put in a physician's opinion is different. And so, you know, years removed from this, I wouldn't wish this on anyone ever, but we have learned a lot in the process of almost believing in ourselves and doing whatever it takes to restore what has been lost or taken. And people are getting better. That's the thing. I know people have gotten better only using homeopathy. Mm -hmm. I know people who have gotten better only doing antibiotics. (laughs) And some people do long term and some people do short term. But the one consistent factor for every single one of those people is that they are eating really good food. Oh, that's a good piece of advice and a good thing to know. Yeah, they're all eating really good food. And even for us, we're in the process of moving from New Mexico into Colorado. But one of the things that I would have never thought, we want a house with a well. Because here in Rio Rancho, where we are, Mm -hmm. water is a huge issue in New Mexico. We pay huge penalties just to bathe. (laughs) Yeah. But we can't even we can't even grow a garden because the water, first of mm-hmm. all, has fluoride in it. But mm-hmm. secondly, it's just not affordable. Yeah. And so for us, it's changed the way we think. And forget if I mention this, we actually sold our house to go pay for in yeah. when I went through treatment. Yeah, you sold, said that. Yeah, every asset we had. We will not buy another house until we can afford to eat the food that we need to eat. Yeah as a family. And I would have never said organic food is that important beforehand. It is, and it is yeah. because without your health, so much of your life is going to be off limits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like, like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that fairy and what you might've learned from it. Okay. I feel like my biggest failure, and I thought a lot about this in the last couple of days, my biggest failure I believe has been our financial situation. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of extenuating circumstances. You know, I used to run a real estate office and yet haven't been able to work in seven years. And so that's, that's a huge thing. We went from a two income household to a one and we have three people we're trying to treat for Lyme disease. So literally every penny can get absorbed into your treatments and protocols. Mm -hmm. But that's been the hardest one of the hardest aspects of this journey is not being able to provide for my kids in the way that I anticipated. Yeah. And we have five kids, so there's a big family, big families just have different dynamics. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I have learned from that is we will never be in this situation again because we were trading our time for money. If we did not go, yeah, if we didn't go into work, we didn't get paid. Yep. And What it forced us to do, and we have a bunch of different entrepreneurial projects unfolding, but it's forced us to figure out ways of earning passive income Mm -hmm. that aren't dependent on how I feel that day. Yeah. So that's been, and I mean, we've been on this journey for a couple of years now and we're not, we're not there yet, but 
five years from now, we will not be in the same position. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and yeah. Th th thank you to our mentors, John Lee Dumas being one of them for yes. <laughs> showing us, the, showing us how to do podcasts and having a daily, you know, entrepreneurial podcast on how to get out of the rat race. Exactly. So. And that's what, you know, we had listened to a four hour work week or we listened to a lot of audiobooks. Yeah. and the four hour work week, he talks about having this short work week so he can go and roam the earth and explore and do all these fun things. Mm -hmm. And we were saying, we're like, we need a four hour work week because I have chronic fatigue yeah. and, <laughs> you know, it's different yeah. circumstances, but that is definitely the direction we're headed in. Yeah. So what do you consider your biggest success? Oh my gosh. Okay. So this is so fun. At the beginning of this year, I spent six months working with a friend of mine on a mini documentary called Disappearing from Society. Oh, wow. And Yes, it's it's only 20 minutes long, but it features um, myself and I do the narrations. I wrote and produced it. And then my friend Mackenzie directed it. And it features three other individuals who have Lyme disease. And one of them is a dear friend of mine. But the another one is someone we actually met through the Lyme Voice podcast. Mm -hmm. And we drove up to Boulder, interviewed them and put this together. And if anyone wants to see it, it's really the social emotional side, the isolation, the financial mm -hmm. loss. Yeah. If you go to limevoice.com and sign up for our newsletter, it'll get emailed to you right away. But Perfect. that literally has been one of the funnest things I've ever been a part of. Nice. I can I hear the excitement in your voice. It was amazing. And it, it's a heavy topic. So it's not oh, yeah. like a happy, feel good movie. But, oh, my gosh, to be able to tell someone's story, it, it was just an incredible experience. Nice. So what, yeah. dri what drives you? Gosh, I want my life back in mm -hmm. the sense of I want the freedom to go play with my kids and <laughs> go out to dinner. You know, yeah. so much of just living has been taken from us mm -hmm. because everything you do takes – Time, energy, and resources. Yep. And if you don't have all three of those, you're very limited in what you can do and how you live. And so our big drive has been, one, to prevent our kids from ever experiencing anything like this, mm -hmm. pain-wise, neurological-wise, but even financially, we don't want them to have this burden. And so that's been our big drive, is yeah. trying to spare our kids from... from not knowing, not knowing how to get better. Yeah. Yeah. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? Yes. So William Rawls is a physician and he wrote a book called Suffered Long Enough. It's called A Physician's Journey of Overcoming Fibro Fibromyalgia, Chronic Fatigue, and Lyme. And this was one of the first books I read about Lyme, and mm -hmm. I love it. I am a highlighter. Like, I actually <laughs> like <laughs> books. And I have probably three-fourths of that book highlighted and doggy-eared. And yeah. he does a great job of just describing the uphill battle. He, at the beginning of his book, he talks about trying to climb up the side of a well that you fell in. And mm -hmm. that's what you face every day is climbing up this well. And sometimes you get a couple feet up. Sometimes you don't. And throughout the night when you're not sleeping, you're hanging on by your fingertips. And, you know, you spend years trying to climb out of this well and you get up there and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's no balloons falling from the sky. Right. No one's congratulating you. You just are at the beginning. And, he talks about his experience, he talks about nutrition, and he also gives a lot of really practical information for supporting your immune system. Yeah. So that is my number one recommendation. Beautiful. Suffered long enough. Yeah. So before we go to this next question, I just want to kind of give our listeners a heads up. The reason I wanted Sarah on the show today was to share about Lyme and her experiences with Lyme. And I, I just want to share with you, Sarah, that your experience is not very not that dissimilar than mine and many of the people that I talk to. So I I just wanted to do a shout out to you and to our listeners that the reason I wanted you here was to really get people educated 
about Lyme and you know some of the things that you can do about it. So thank you yeah. for that. And my and my final question for you is what final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Throughout our podcast, we talk about fighting as a mindset, healing as a choice, and living as an outcome. And so fight, heal, and live is really the theme of mm. what we try to embrace. Because I had spent a couple of years meeting with people who, you know, sitting in a coffee shop or something who had gotten diagnosed and kind of giving them the spiel of, okay, here's where to start. Here's the physicians that you can see. Here's, co- you know, this is why coffee enemas are important. This is why juicing mm-hmm. and kind of just trying to create a pathway for them. And about two years into it, I realized that people were having very different results. Some people would take mm-hmm. the information and run. Some people never opened a book or went and saw a physician. And then some people were doing some of the stuff, but like the results were very varied. And one of the things I just came to realize, and we talk about this in the documentary and on the podcast, is that fighting is a mindset. Mm-hmm. And the, the options and the resources and the physicians we all have access to are very, very different. But if you are not approaching this with a mindset that you are going to get better, you are going to fight, you are going to find a physician who will take you seriously it just seems like the mindset paves the way, whatever path people end up going down, antibiotics or not antibiotics, mm-hmm. homeopathy, it's that mindset that you need that says, I will not be defeated. I will fight to live and not just exist. Yeah. And so even if you don't feel like you have a lot of energy or resources, fighting is a mindset and getting educated is just probably one of the best ways that you can serve yourself and everything you learn will serve you for years to come. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You learn something and it, it bubbles over into different aspects of your life. And so just to hold on to that, that you've got to embrace that inner fight within Mm -hmm. you in order to have your needs heard and, and to survive, but that it's worth it. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Sarah. Greg, thank you so much for having me. And I love what you guys are doing on your podcast. Thank you. I cannot wait to be in a city where I can <laughs> grow some grow food. Some food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I want to I take a couple minutes here and just, first of all, how can our listeners get a hold of you? You mentioned a couple of things that you've done. I want to, you know, I want to cover the book. Where they can, can they get the book? You mentioned your little, your documentary. We want to talk about that briefly. And generally, how do they get a hold of you? Okay, yeah, I'm on Facebook more than anything else, and so Sarah Slickty Sanchez. We also have Lime Voice on Facebook. You can email me, SanchezSmile at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. And the documentary will be available for the public in August. But for now, it is on our newsletter. If you sign up for our newsletter, you'll get the email or the video emailed to you. Perfect. And then our book, Little Bite, Big Trouble, like I said, it's a children's book and it talks about having to take antibiotics, having to eat juice and organic vegetables and all that fun stuff. But that is available on Amazon. And that's Perfect. Little Bite, Big Trouble. Little Bite, Big Trouble. Perfect. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash Lime Voice. And that's L-Y-M-E-V-O-I-S-E. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Nature doesn't waste energy. And by using these natural cycles to work in our favor, we can harvest both plants and fish. Let us teach you how. Just text GROWFISH to 33444 or visit IWANTTOGROWFISH.COM and you will receive our free webinar on how to grow your own fish-powered garden. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.